Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this meeting of the UW System Board of Regents. Megan, will you please call the roll? Regent President Walsh? Here. Regent Vice President Bogus? Here. Regent Adams? Here. Regent Atwell? Here. Regent Bechtel? Here. Regent Cologne? Here. Regent Jones? <clears throat> Regent Menideeds? Here. Regent Miller? Here. Regent Posh? Here. Thank you. Regent Peterson? Here. Regent Prince? Present. Regent Rye? Here. Thank you. Regent Staten? Here. Thank you. Regent Tucker? Here. Thank you. Regent Underly? Here. Regent Wax? Here. And Regent Weatherly? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you, Megan. Are there board members who wish to declare any conflicts of interest regarding today's open session agenda? Hearing none, let's proceed. I now call upon Regent Bechtel to present a report of the Business and Finance Committee. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, the Business and Finance Committee convened yesterday, and after we approved the minutes of our December meeting, we proceeded with our agenda as follows. The committee first heard a presentation from our host campus entitled Finance and Administrative Opportunities for UW-Madison. Vice Chancellor for Finance and Administration, uh, Rob Kramer, provided an overview of efforts by the university to generate new revenue and implement op operational improvements. While these activities have achieved positive results, UW-Madison recognizes that a highly competitive market necessitates continual identification and pursuit of new strategies that advance the mission of our flagship university. Next, the committee approved the UW system status report on large or high risk information technology projects. That report was in our packet, it's quite extensive. It provides that the, uh, it, the, our report was provided by the chief information officer, Stephen Hopper. It details the status of 10 major IT projects within the system, including the procure to pay automation project, which was completed on schedule and under budget uh, since the last report in August of 2022. Other project milestones since then include the completion of the what they call the architect phase of the Administrative Transformation Program, ATP. For other projects still in progress, the report offers updates on their schedule, scope, and budget. Uh, pretty big dollars here. The total budget portfolio is $251 million, uh, but nicely, it is a 3.2% decrease compared to the report we got in August. Uh, the committee then approved the annual report on the strategic plans for major IT projects, also presented by Stephen Hopper. Again, this report was in our packet for all of us to read. It was the one that was about 10 pages long and then a 17-page agenda with very small font, if you remember that report. Um, now, that provides an inventory of all ongoing and new projects, both enterprise-wide and institution-specific, and that includes information on each project's business need, impact, staffing requirements, and budget. Both reports that I've just mentioned here will be submitted to the legislature's Joint Committee on Information Policy and Technology pursuant to state statute uh, as we are required to do annually. <clears throat> Next, the committee approved an amendment to UW Systems Agreement with Huron Consulting Group to assist with implementation of Workday software related again to ATP, the Administrative Transformation Program. The amendment will provide for additional professional services based on information discovered through the planning um, and architect stages that I mentioned before of this project, this will cost up to 1.2.6 million, 1.26 million, while it removes a platform as service uh, strategy from the project scope. Next, the committee approved an amendment to the UW-Madison's agreement, again, with Huron Consulting Services, also related to ATP. The amendment represents change orders to the statement of work totaling about $690,000 for additional resources specifically focused on the integration of the Huron research administrative software and the employee compensation compliance mo module. And as we heard, this was another indication of some of the, the labor pressures we have because we're actually gonna have to have some more uh, person hours coming from the consultant uh, to move this project forward on time mm -hmm. and on budget. Next, the committee approved three separate agreements on behalf of UW Superior. This is really exciting. Uh, if you recall, we went to uh, Superior a couple of years back and many of us toured the uh, research facility on the lake. And uh, I'm really happy and pleased for Superior that they've, got, they've landed some pretty large uh, federal contracts. Uh, so congratulations to our friends at Superior. Um, this is, these monies will flow to the Lake Superior Research Institute. 
Uh, they were awarded federal funding for the evaluation of ballast treatment technologies within the ships that are moving through the Great Lakes uh, and other seaways. Uh, in the first two agreements, Algoma Central Corporation is a subgrantee. They're going to be carrying testing equipment on two different vessels that are moving in and out of the Superior Port. Um, one project will research the effectiveness of a chemical technology in treating the ballast water. The other focuses on an ultraviolet treatment solution, so chemical and ultraviolet to kind of remove some of those contaminants within the ballast water. These agreements are valued at 1.9 million and 1.1 million respectively. The third agreement that Superior landed is with Interlake Steamship Company. That's a project budget of 2.1 million. So really nice dollars flowing into Superior and helping us with this research. The research aboard their vessel will evaluate the effectiveness of filter technology in treating ballast water to current discharge standards. So uh, uh, Madam Regent President, in conclusion, on behalf of the Business and Finance Committee, I now move for approval of agenda items F, G, H, I, J, K, and L. Thank you, Regent Bechtel. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is uh, any discussion, any questions for Regent Bechtel? Hearing none, I'll call the question. All in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Um, aye. Hearing none, passes. Thank you very much, Regent Bechtel. Appreciate it. Now we're going to turn to Regent Weatherly for a report on the Education Committee. Uh, thank you, Regent President Walsh. At our meeting yesterday, the Education Committee approved six programs, discussed international students, had a host presentation on emerging technology, and a report from the Direct Admissions Task Force. Committee action items, including approval of the, the December 2022 meeting minutes and there's a list here, guys. Buckle in. Um, UW Green Bay Master of Science in Biodiversity Conservation and Management. This fully online program in partnership with UW Extended Campus will prepare graduates for careers in as environmental scientists and managers, conservation scientists and directors, and geological and hydrological technicians. It is orientated to those in the field and offers four-year standalone certificates. Number two, a UW-Madison Bachelor of Science Education in Elementary Education and Special Education will help fill a, a, a shortage of teachers prepared to serve the needs of diversifying student body. Wisconsin schools. Three, a UW-Madison educational specialist degree in educational leadership and policy analysis. Graduates will be eligible for a DPI administrator license to serve as superintendents in Wisconsin schools. Jill, I'm sure you're looking forward to this. To increase opportunities to provide a positive social, cultural, economic impact in Wisconsin. The program will target working professionals and students who do not want to complete a doctorate. Fourth, UW-Milwaukee, Doctor of Philosophy and Mechanical Engineering. This elevates an existing track to, stand, to a standalone degree that will be more rec recognizable credential. This requires no, no new courses or faculty and builds on current areas of strength, including renewable energy, robotics, power storage, tribology, optics, sensor development, structural health monitoring, and water, uh, water filtration. Uh, fifth, UW-Milwaukee Bachelor of Architecture in Architecture. The five-year, 150-credit-hour professional program will enable its graduates to pursue licensure. The program saves one full year of study and significant costs for students. It provides many opportunities to serve the city and will attract diverse students who are interested in better design of their cities and community. And lastly, uh, UW River Falls Master of Science in Business Analytics. The program elevates a track in our existing MBA program. Full-time students will be able to complete the coursework in one fiscal year. The program adds a more technical choice to business graduate programs and meets a growing need. Our main focus was recruiting and supporting international students. Facilitated by UW's Superior Provost Maria Cuso, the discussion included perspectives from student, international students from Zambia, Saudi Arabia, Nepal, and Nigeria, and campus professionals at UW Stevens Point, Stout, and Platteville, highlighting the unique experience of these students. This discussion fits within the context of UW System Strategic Plan and the Office of Academic and Student Affairs focus on strategic internationalization, which explores how international opportunities can help 
meet enrollment and civic leadership goals, and for students to benefit from high impact practices and pair to live and work in a globalized society. We then heard the host presentation from UW Madison uh, Provost Carl Schultz and his team entitled Adapting to Change, AI, ChatGPT, and Higher Education. This presentation helps us better understand recent changes in the world of technology including sharp, sharply increasing student interest in computer science, and more recently, the development of new artificial intelligent tools, including ChatGPT, uh, that promise to disrupt, disrupt discovery, creation, and learning. And I know this will be, will be the subject of longer conversations for the board in the future. <laughs> I also want to thank Carl for his years of service and helping us better understand many important topics and higher education issues. Thank you. Finally, we received the, re the report from the Direct Admission uh, Task Force. Following an initial discussion of potential benefits, challenges, and examples of direct admission pro uh, programs in other states in our August meeting, the, op the Office of Academic and Student Affairs convened a task force to provide a recommendation regarding the potential feasibility of direct admissions within the UW system. Task, fo task Force co-chairs Jennifer Jones from UW-Green Bay and Korea Diaz-Suazo from UW System presented their preliminary report. They describe the task force goals, process, and potential implementation issues, along with the recommended timeline for next steps and considerations. Regent President, this concludes my report. Therefore, I move for a Thank you, Regent Walks. Uh, any discussion, questions for Regent Weatherly? Seeing none, call the question. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Motion passes. Next, we have Regent Rye to report on the CAP Planning and Budget Committee, and he's with us virtually this morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Regent President Walsh. The Capital Planning and Budget Committee met to consider three resolutions and receive a presentation by Cindy Tortsvite on transforming the built environment. Ms. Tortsvite. Associate Vice Chancellor for Facilities Planning and Management at UW-Madison, provided the committee with background on the university's physical infrastructure, which led to an overview of the university's current slate of capital projects, which barely begins to address the significant academic and research facilities needs due to their aging physical infrastructure. She reported to the committee that the university's deferred maintenance backlog is now about $2.1 billion. She walked the committee through various capital investment charts, which demonstrates that competing universities are outpacing UW-Madison's investment pattern, which heightens the university's need to work harder and faster to remain competitive. She highlighted various strategies the university is employing to address strategic needs, such as targeted demolition, leveraging existing delivery models like the UW-Managed Program, and deploying common sense financial strategies, such as partnering with University Research Park and developing public-private partnerships. We followed her presentation with a good committee conversation on bonding authority for UW-Madison and the need for UW to remain competitive with their peers. The committee commenced the meeting with item D, the consent agenda, which includes a UW-managed capital project and the sale of a house. The committee approved all the consent items. Next, the committee considered UW Systems' request to revise and use evaluation criteria for major capital projects. Each biennium, UW System Administration staff apply approved evaluation criteria to the major capital project requests submitted for consideration in the UW System Capital Budget Request. Approved criteria have been applied in this manner since 1999 and 2001 biennium, and they've been periodically updated and enhanced as needed to reflect current system-wide initiatives, priorities, and goals of the Board of Regents. Last updated in February of 2019, these criteria assist in developing a biennial capital budget request and six-year capital plan that address the most critical needs, highest academic priorities, and most effective uh, solutions to maintain and develop each university's physical environment. The recommended revisions emphasize the 2023-28 strategic plan commitment to stewardship through accountability and integrity and support the purpose-driven service in both the resulting facilities and associated planning process. The proposed modifications address two primary shortcomings of the current evaluation criteria, consideration of net new square footage in specific but rare contexts, and demonstration of appropriate diligence and management of past capital budget funding authority 
and project enumerations relative to the proposed capital plan. These shortcomings were identified during the current biennial planning cycle and the proposed revision intend to resolve these issues for the pending and future planning cycles. Item E was approved by the committee. The committee considered and approved item F to amend RPD 13-5, capital projects solely managed by the UW system approval and signature authority. Currently, the policy requires any projects of more than $1 million to be presented to the Board of Regents for formal approval prior to execution. Additionally, only chancellors can approve such projects at or below the $1 million threshold for board approval. Didn't I? I think we lost your audio. Oh, uh -oh. we started to hear you again there. You're, you're breaking right. up a little bit of show. Sorry about that. Uh, that happened yesterday when I was listening to you guys as well. Uh, the proposed changes would permit a chancellor to delegate approval authority for capital projects solely managed by the UW system to other university employees, providing that the chancellor has requested and received approval for the specific delegation from the UW system president. Additionally, the current policy permits the UW system president to approve the rel related design and construction content contracts for capital projects solely managed by the UW system up to a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Providing the UW system president contract signature authority up to $5 million without obtaining board approval also aligns with recently expanded signature authority provided to the UW system president for grants and contracts under region policy document 13-1 general account approval signature authority and, uh, and reporting. We concluded the meeting with an update by senior associate vice president Alex Rowe on the 2023-25 capital budget process and the February 3rd State Building Commission meeting. Madam President, that completes my report. I move resolution D, which includes D1 and D2, and resolutions E and F. Thank I'll you, second. Regent Rice. Second. Thank you, Regent Walks. Any discussion, questions for Regent Rice? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. And last but not least, report of the Audit Committee, Regent Miller. Thank you, Regent President Walsh. The Audit Committee met yesterday morning. Chief Audit Executive Lori Stortz reviewed the progress to date on the fiscal year 2023 audit plan. She confirmed that her office is making excellent progress on the plan with a number of audits currently in progress. She expects to bring more reports to the committee when we meet again in March. Ms. Stortz also reported the preliminary planning has begun for the fiscal 2024 audit plan. Ms. Stortz then provided a high-level summary of the results of audits recently issued by the Office of Internal Audit since we last met in December 2022. This included the NCAA Athletics Division I Agreed Upon Procedures Engagement Executive Summary, the NCAA Agreed Upon Procedures Reports for UW-Green Bay and UW-Milwaukee, and an executive the regents to ask the interim senior vice president for academic and student affairs johanna spritz consider both economic economy of scale and risk management with his in, uh, international education working groups next angela ryan director of risk management and edward murphy associate vice president and chief information security officer presented an update to the committee on cyber insurance renewal for the uw system the regions commended risk management and information security for their work to lower the number of information security incidents and to obtain insurance coverage in a very hard market. The committee then heard from Chief Compliance Officer Paige Smith, who described the implementation status of System Policy 625, youth protection and compliance across the UW system. The regents discussed, the, discussed and confirmed there is training for all volunteers online and it is being tracked. The regions stressed the importance in that we are continuing to do so because parents entrust their lives and safety of their children with us. And furthermore, this good work should be promoted to the public. In addition to this, the regents asked that we be provided information on those who are screened out of the program. Last athletic director, Adam Barnes, associate athletic director and CFO for business operations, Katie Aaron Smith, senior associate athletic director and senior woman administrator, and Doug Teed, senior associate athletic director for student services. They needed uh, five 
man basketball team, five person basketball team to complete, uh, to inform us of this 110 page report uh, that they presented to us uh, regarding the UW Madison NCAA Division I Athletics 2021 2022 report. The regents acknowledged the extraordinary performance of our athletic program, both financially and academically, and discussed the transformation of the NCAA. This transformation is extreme and will create opportunities and complicated challenges, causing program leaders to consider what will be the best metrics to measure success going forward. The regents thank the participants for all they are doing for the institution and the UW system. This concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regent Miller. Uh, before we proceed, I want to let you know that in order to accommodate some timing issues, we're going to change the order of the next few agenda items. So first up, we will have the student spotlight followed by the UW-Madison University Business Partnership presentation, and then the educator appreciation video. We will resume our regularly scheduled programming after that. There'll be a quiz. <laughs> At this time, we have the opportunity to hear directly from a student here at UW-Madison. I would like to invite Lori Reeser, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs at UW-Madison, to introduce our next speaker. And while she's approaching the podium, um, I want to publicly acknowledge that this student, Enda Mizea Fonkem, was on the search committee for the Chancellor uh, of UW-Madison. So we, we thank her uh, publicly for that. Thank you. Um, yes, we coordinated. Actually, we didn't coordinate close this morning. Um, I had a different dress on and I thought, no, I got to go with the polka dots and now I know why. So um, anyway, good morning. I'm Lori Reeser, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. I use the pronoun she, her, hers. And I have the best job on campus because every day I get to work with amazing students. And this morning, it's my honor and privilege to introduce our student speaker, Endemazia Fonkem. It's challenging to find one speaker to capture the essence of UW-Madison, and yet this student does so in the way, in the many ways she leads her peers role as the chair of Associated Students of Madison, which is a large and complex shared governance group that prides itself on its commitment to student representation and decision-making on campus. Like many of our students, when Endemazia got to campus, she jumped into leadership roles. She has led Communications for PAVE, a student organization that promotes awareness and empowerment for survivors of sexual assault. She's been involved with the Wisconsin Union Council, African Student Association, Black Student Union, and many others. She's worked with the Mayor's Innovation Project and REAP Food, Gov food Group as a policy research assistant, and she sits on the Madison Food Policy Council. She's done all of this while working part-time and sometimes full-time as a barista, bartender, or food pantry assistant at various restaurants and nonprofits in the area. As the chair mentioned, as, as sophomore last year, she, she served on the um, Chancellor Search Committee, and we're grateful for her bringing Chancellor Manukin to UW. And Namazia's energy is endless. Her sense of humor, delightful, and her sincere curiosity is refreshing. We had our first official meeting in her role as chair this summer, and I said, do you have any questions? And she said, yes, actually, I have a couple. And I thought, oh, it's going to be about administration or structure. And she said, my first question is, how have you documented your life? And are you satisfied with your documentation? <laughs> okay. And then the second was, do you have mementos to remind you that you are loved? Wow. I, I, I'm not really sure I still know the answers to those questions. But this demonstrates her genuine interest in others and in truly making the world a better place. I'm proud to introduce Anamazia Fankam. UW System President Rothman, UW System President Walsh, the UW System Board of Regents and Chancellors, hello. My name is Endemazia Fonkam. I'm currently a junior at UW-Madison studying landscape and urban studies and human geography with minors in environmental studies and global health. And I have the distinct privilege of serving as this year's chair of the Associated Students of Madison. And more than anything else, I'm a byproduct of the UW system through and through. My parents immigrated to the United States from Cameroon in 1998. If you don't know what that, where that is, my dad goes, Africa, here. Um, they promptly moved to Wisconsin, a place they felt safe, encouraged, and accepted as a part of their community. In the fall 
following decade, my mother's and two brothers graduated from UW Oshkosh, Green Bay, and Madison, with two more siblings uh, graduating from Madison in the concurrent decade. Quickly, both my parents found employment teaching adjunct at UW Fox Cities and UW Oshkosh. In fact, the attendance of a UW school for my family meant a pathway forward in a new world that they have grown and adapted to for the past 25 years. The day I got into UW-Madison, which was rounding out my second week of an extended spring break in my senior year of high school during a year that we all don't remember, mm -hmm. it was somewhat anticlimactic. On March 24th, 2020, my college decisions were essentially my new markers of time as it passed. I opened my email every day when I woke up, and for some reason, that was at six in the morning, and I had two letters in my inbox, one acceptance letter and one cost of attendance letter. At the bottom of the latter, it said four magic words, estimated family contribution, zero. Two things then happened in fast and rapid succession. One, I shoved my sister awake, a UW-Madison graduate from 2018, and I begin, immediately began bragging and making tuition promise and my mom was sleeping her eyes and a soft smile went oh thank god I, I didn't know how we were going to do that <laughs> it was decided then amongst the chaos and uncertainty of the year that one thing was certain I was attending UW-Madison I committed here without having ever visited campus I knew nothing about the city or the campus besides the fact that there was a really big hill and as the world felt like it was crashing all around us I was dropped off at a residential hall at age 17 and given a tearful goodbye and good luck. These days, I still think about that good luck because I've needed it. I've reflected a lot on my parents' journey recently as rhetoric we hear starts to rise in its alarm. Increasingly, I think we've all started to feel like the world is ending. The dates we hear, if carbon emissions aren't curbed by 2030 or 2040, sea levels rise, forest fires, drought, avian flu, the price of eggs. With constant messaging about the end of the world, it can feel like we're living through the apocalypse. And yet when you break down the apocalypse, it becomes clear that the apocalypse has already happened in many ways for many peoples, many times over, and that that constitutes our present day existence. The etymology of the word, word apocalypse reveals its origins in the Greek apocalyptine, which means to uncover, disclose, or reveal. And its meaning to be a world ending event didn't arise until the 1850s. So why am I talking about the apocalypse at a Board of Regents meeting? <laughs> if we peel back the doomsday elements and focus again on the original meanings of apocalypse, a large moment that reveals something, then we can acknowledge that in our lives, we have survived many different apocalypses. Students my age, in fact, have never known life without it. I was born into a post 9-11 world. I entered kindergarten when the housing market crashed and began the 2008 recession. I was in fifth grade during the Sandy Hook massacre and continued my education through the hundreds of mass shootings that followed, and I graduated high school in May 2020 when absolutely nothing weird or strange was happening in the world. My life has been measured in what Dickens would call epochs of incredulity, times in which no one can really fathom just what is happening. And out of all these apocalypses, I have left feeling like whether the world stopped completely or just kept turning, I had changed somehow. I was more cautious, I was braver, I was kinder or more understanding, and most of all, I was scared. I say this all to ask you a question. What is the role of a university in an apocalypse? The University of Wisconsin system has created 26 cities on the hill, meccas of intellectualism and art and communities of joy and resistance. In every disaster movie, there's a before and an after. The survivors left in the rubble to attempt to rebuild a society that meets the needs of whoever is left. They don't often start by creating an electoral college system. Instead, they start small and they assess who they need to serve and how to best do so. Often what they come up with are based, based in the ideals we all keep close to our chest, egalitarian, meritorious, fair, just societies. When you ask my parents why they left Cameroon, they'll give you one short answer, their kids. They were comfortable, surrounded by a support system of family and friends, and working good jobs before they decided to move across the Atlantic. They weren't running from anything, but they were seeking something in particular, a world where they could give their children the greatest education possible. So they left everything they had ever known behind to not only change their lives as they had always known them, but to create a new life for their family, one in which justice, fairness, equity, and mutual care were fundamental to the fabric of their new society. And so no wonder they came here and no wonder they found UW. 
My time on campus for the past three years has not been without its challenges, paramount amongst them being a black and disabled student on a predominantly white and abled campus. And the potential friend if people assumed I had to live in the multicultural learning community, which I didn't, or that I had to be an international student, which I'm not, though I pretended to be British for a day just to see what happened, <laughs> or my favorite, that my major was African cultural studies, which it's not. My first apocalypse on this campus was facing the dining hall. In front of it is a huge green where students would picnic, play catch, and experience the last days of summer on the lawn before school began. It terrified me because never once did I see another student of color in that space. With COVID still the main concern on everyone's mind, the outdoors was the sole spot of socialization for new college students. And I could see the dining hall and the green from my dorm window. That place terrified me because it felt like a landscape that exemplified that I was the sore thumb. How unfortunate that something so fundamental, food, would incite such anxieties. I ate in that dining hall one time my freshman year and I didn't return until two months ago. Experiences like this continues throughout my time and feeling othered is one of the most dissonant feelings within the human experience. It's hard. Finding, finding and forming communities on this and any college campus is, is a task that begins with histories that feel in some way or another exclusionary. It's not impossible though through spaces like student government, where policy buffs and Robert's Rules aficionados can tout their high school debate skills, of which I am the sixth best speaker in the state of Wisconsin in the year 2019. Places like Memorial Union, where I can attend classical music concert series to remind me of my 10 years as a cellist, or programs like planning and landscape architecture that let me write and draw and design the cities of the future. My identity lies in much more than what I look like and where I'm from at the same time that it is rooted in what I look like and where I'm from. It is the project of every young person to find a place where they belong. It is both incredibly easy and incredibly difficult to complete this project on a college campus, so easy and so difficult that it seems world ending. The spirit of rebuilding, resilience, sustainability, and community, of creating worlds better for the next generation and the one that follows was integral to how I grew up. And it's a value I carry with me as I walk through my own life. It's a value I see ingrained in the origins of this university system and the basis of the way my education is framed. Last semester, when listening to Richard Butler, a guest speaker invited to campus for a panel about equity within the climate change movement, I heard him say, I say yes to every opportunity that is presented to me because I know if I don't, there might not be a person that looks like me in that room. What a burden that is for our students who look different, for our students that feel different to know that without saying yes to every opportunity, someone like them may not be there. I was asked to speak today and I said yes. I said yes because when's the next time someone like me will be offered the opportunity to be in this room? I mean, how many sixth best speakers in the state of Wisconsin are there? <laughs> Let's think about the apocalypse again. After everything has collapsed, what do you want to rise through the ashes? The University of Wisconsin system has in it over 161,000 students, 161,000 doomsday survivors. As regents, think of yourself as the humble, grizzled leaders tasked with protecting everyone left after the disaster. What are you doing to ensure we get through this and get through this together? What are you doing to make sure that the worlds we create now are better than the ones we left behind? What do you do first? You were chosen to lead for a reason, and as was I. I hope you'll hold with you the weight of your position and the thought of the world you're creating with every decision you make. Thank you for your invitation to be here, and thank you for your time this morning. Thank you so much, and Isaiah. Oh, don't go away yet. Um, if you don't mind, please stay at the podium, and Uh 
if if you're the sixth best speaker, I'd like to meet speakers one through five, perhaps. One of them is the student body president at UW Eau Claire. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> Any uh, questions or comments for Enda Mazea? Yeah. Um, you inspire me. I, uh, you are the Wisconsin idea and um, the resilience and the class that you share with all of us is um, your class act. Thank you so much for being who you are and for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Thanks again for, for coming down and talking to us. Looking forward to seeing you again on campus. Thank you. I live a block away. It wasn't that hard. All right. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. In keeping with its commitment to the Wisconsin idea, UW-Madison has a very long history of collaborating with business and industry, both in Wisconsin and beyond. It's an important strength and an area for more opportunities. Today, business partners with UW-Madison work with us in a huge variety of ways. And today we're gonna to learn more from a panel who will share their experiences with university business partnerships, the impact of those collaborations, their thoughts on what the university can do to better partner with industry, and why it's important to maintain a strong university for the economic health of the state. Here to kick things off and introduce today's panelists, once again, here's our host, Chancellor Jennifer Manukin. Thank you all for uh, the warm welcome you gave to one of our truly extraordinary students. Uh, we are now going to turn to this uh, panel and I appreciate the opportunity for this discussion about the importance of partnerships between the university and outstanding businesses throughout the state of Wisconsin. This is I think one of, uh, one of, one of the great strengths here and also a place where we can do even more. Uh, you heard yesterday a little bit about uh, the relatively familiar story about the university's role in building this region into a major center of talent and innovation. And this panel gives us a chance to look at that a little bit more closely. Every day, UW-Madison faculty, staff, and students are working with industry in our region, across our state and beyond, and I know the same is true for my uh, sister schools as well, that these connections really matter to improve lives and solve some of the world's toughest challenges. These partnerships also give students exceptional learning opportunities and help to grow the economy. It's also a place, I mean, it's a place where there's a lot of success and a lot of great stories, but where I do think we can do more and we can uh, think in bigger ways still. Here, uh, we went through a pretty extensive self-evaluation process uh, to pursue the APLU's Innovation and Economic Prosperity designation. Uh, and as I mentioned yesterday, we were one of nine universities to receive this last year. Um, but the process was valuable, not just because we got a plaque, though we'll take the plaque, uh, but because we learned about our strengths and also about areas of, of future possibility. And we're working on those. And um, I want to thank the Board of Regents for helping us in one of those areas. The additional contract flexibility that you approved in June makes getting to a yes with industry research contracts a meaningful step faster and easier. Uh, as I mentioned, but it's worth repeating, uh, we are 54th in the country for our sponsored research funding, and so there is room for improvement, but it's also important to say we generated $31.5 million in industry-sponsored research, so we are doing this in a pretty significant way. There's also some underreporting going on, um, but I think we also are underperforming here compared to some of our peer schools, and I want to work with others to change that. I'm committed to doing our part, and I ask uh, for your support as well. Uh, by working together and partnering with our friends in the business community, we can better achieve the Wisconsin idea and create impact and value, not just for Madison, but for the entire state. 
So on to our very distinguished panel who were kind enough to give us some of their time today, all of experiences working with UW-Madison and with other higher ed institutions here in our state. They represent large companies and the startup sector, and we've asked them to share some of their experiences and to speak to the importance of a strong university system and a strong UW-Madison in fostering growth and innovation in our great state. Uh, our panelists all deserve uh, distinguished and more elaborate introductions that I'm going to give them. I'm just going to tell you who they are. Uh, we have George Willis Huber, uh, the Richard Antoine Professor of Chemical Engineering at UW-Madison and the co-founder of uh, Anellotech and Pyron. Lisa Johnson, who's the CEO of BioForward Wisconsin. Dan Kelly, who's the Chief Underwriting Officer at American Family Insurance. Tom Westrick, President and Chief Executive Officer of Patient Care Solutions at GE Healthcare. And I'm delighted that our moderator is uh, Dean Glenda Gillespie, uh, the Dean of our uh, College of Agriculture and, Life Sci Agriculture and Life Sciences, who started, I think, here the same day I did. Thank you all for being here today and for your commitment uh, to the university and to fostering innovation and entrepreneurship in the state. I'm really excited to hear this conversation. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you, Chancellor. I'm just going to start us off um, by giving you perspective as a dean to tell you how important industry partnerships are. And I'm give, going to give you some facts about my college. So on the instructional side, nearly half of Cal students at UW-Madison um, do internships with the industry. And we think that helps with our 56% rate of students who have job offers before they graduate. All of our students take a capstone course, and many of those students have an industry engagement in that capstone course. Capstone courses are the sum total of experiences or courses designed to bring that out so a student can really explore their career options. Um, these types of engagements can be industry serving um, a role in the class uh, as a client for an in-class project. And they also may involve employees from businesses and industries coming and talking about careers. Those industry relationships certainly enrich student experiences, but they also are really important for research. So industry partnerships um, allow us to solve real world problems. In many cases, those they bring and highlight those problems to us, things like food safety and my college, water quality, virus transmission. Um, and those types of conversations can inspire researchable questions. In addition, as the chancellor mentioned, it can bring significant funds. My number is 39 million. Um, and since 2019, my college has engaged over 170 different companies in the research mission. So these really drive the innovation sector. So with that background in mind, and remember that's just one college um, amongst the whole UW system, we're gonna look to our guests and learn from their experiences. So I'm going to start with Dan, Tom, and Lisa. So you each have significant experience um, in university business partnerships um, in the UW system. Can you take a few minutes to talk about that experience, what it has involved, different campus units you've worked with, and give a brief example of a specific project to illustrate the nature of that collaboration and its impact on the state? So we'll start with Tom down here. Great. Good morning. Company. Earlier in January, we spun off from General Electric and we're now a separately traded company, um, mostly based here in Wisconsin. So I'm a 1990 graduate of uh, the business school here. And we've had incredible strong relationships as a company with the school since I've been with GE for over 20 years. Our strongest relationship <clears throat> to date is clearly with the School of Medicine and Public Health. About a decade ago, we entered into a 10 year plus agreement, research agreement for almost for over $30 million to provide significant research and intellectual capabilities to our imaging products within our portfolio. Dr. Tom Grist, to say it bluntly, is probably one of the most critical members of the GE healthcare team. His, his team in his collaboration with our group has provided numerous patient solutions, protocols within our imaging portfolio that are on our products today that are served globally around the world. These are protocols, these are um, solutions that literally guide the radiologists 
and how to use our equipment and our use as a standard across the world today. Tom is an integral part of our team. I think when the, the, the uh, it's never been treated as a third party relationship, it's always been treated as a partnership. To, to bring that to light, when we went public here January 4th of 2023, NASDAQ came to uh, Waukesha, Wisconsin to ring the bell that day. And we are lucky enough to be the, the representative company. And we had probably 10, 10 guests, uh, external guests that were with us, and Tom was one of them. So the, the School of Public Health and Medicine is a critical element of our strategy. The 10 year plus, 30 year, 30 million dollar plus arrangement we've had with the school, uh, which I expect to continue, is a fantastic example of. I think the public, the public sector and the school coming together to really drive the solutions for our company and most importantly, patients in the, in our, around the world today. Thank you, Dan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, allowing our, our panel to uh, visit the regions today. Uh, my name is Dan Kelly. I'm the Chief Underwriting Officer at American Family Insurance uh, located here in Madison. I'm a double badger, graduated in 84 and in 85. Uh, uh, undergrad and a, and a master's degree. Um, but to talk about our relationship, American Family and UW Madison have a connection that goes back to our founder uh, who graduated from university in 1911. Uh, he was also a member of the band playing the clarinet. Um, but we have over 500 alums currently employed at American Family across many majors, literally from A, actuarial science to Z, zoology. So really a, a big impact. Um, with both organizations here in Madison, as I said, we're based in Madison, it facilitates us having a very strong relationship. Historically, though, uh, that relationship was a, a number of disparate relationships, individual relationships. It was ad hoc projects that occurred really all across American family with no one really knowing what was going on from one area to the other. I I'm sure you can uh, picture that sort of a scenario. Uh, the number of connection points uh, at American Family was, was quite large. So in 2015, both parties um, agreed to formalize via a holistic arrangement. It was a 10-year arrangement similar to what, what Tom said. And, and what we tried to do is leverage all the potential connections across both organizations. And we set it up across five what we call verticals or, or pillars. There's, there's one for athletics. There's one for affinity marketing. There's one for community relations, there's one for talent management, and there's one for data science. So we have five pillars that we try to manage. So what was important about it uh, at the time was both sides provided a single point of contact to coordinate the, the interaction between the two sides. Uh, for the University of Wisconsin-Madison, it was the Office of Corporate Relations at the time. Now it's called uh, the Office of Business Engagement. Throughout each academic year, the, the various vertical leads from American Family and the vertical leads from UW-Madison, they interact and, and discuss what sort of projects and initiatives make sense for, for both parties. Um, so identifying one specific project is hard for, for me. Uh, I mentioned five pillars, but one that I, I will bring up is in our community relations vertical. Community relations is very important to American Family and its culture, and it's very important to the University of Wisconsin. And I would mention the Odyssey project that, that UW-Madison has. It's a, um, really it's a family approach to um, counteracting generational poverty. It's for non-traditional or returning adult students primarily, and it gives them opportunity to activity. Um, in fact, I would share with you that uh, a couple of years ago, the partnership leadership team from UW and from American Family, we held our semi-annual uh, partnership review meeting at the Odyssey offices on the south side of Madison. And we had some testimonials from some folks that had gone through that program. And you talk about something motivating and inspirational. It, it sure made us feel good about that partnership we have with UW in that uh, particular space. Great, thanks, Lisa. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I hate being the oldest person at this table. So I graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in December, 1983. So before those guys at the end of the table. Good to hear, um, good to hear. <laughs> a BA in finance. 
Um, a, a little disclaimer, there's a few people in this room that know me. Um, I am a very open person. I just say things. Um, I am passionate about this university system and not just the Badgers, all those systems that are sitting over there as well. So you are gonna hear a lot of compliments that go to not just this university, um, but those other universities as well. Um, I not a scientist, as you were hearing. I graduated from the business school here. Um, I am now with BioForward Wisconsin that represents Wisconsin's biohealth industry. So what is that? That's biotech, medical device, digital health, diagnostics, um, and our research institutions. So I'm going to take this from a couple different approaches, first from my personal experience, um, and then talking about our companies a little bit. So in the, number, in the summer of 1989, I joined three scientists in starting a company called Novagen. It was Life Science Reagents Company. Our first product, Peacite Vector, and our first sale came in 1990. And it was developed from a technology created at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Dr. Ann Palmenberg's lab. We licensed it through Wharf. Novagen would not have been, it, Novagen would not have existed for the innovation coming out of the UW-Madison. We had many products that we licensed through the years that had a major impact on Novagen. We were sold um, in 1998 to a company called Merck KGAA out of Germany. Um, and that they, we were their first life science play. And now you, that company is known as Millipore Sigma. From that impactful experience, that first one with Novagen in 1998, they now have locations employing well over 1,000 in individuals in Wisconsin, in Madison, Verona, Milwaukee, and Sheboygan. You heard from Tom how critical this university is to GE Healthcare. Our industry cannot possibly have the breadth of internal R&D, the broad base of innovation required to stay competitive. We are reliant on our universities to support our university to support our industry's R and D efforts that bring life saving products to market, create jobs, and substantial economic impact throughout the state. I'd like to give you some of that data so you understand the impact that this university has through this industry. We employ 129,000 people, 32 billion in economic output, and 1.2 billion in state and local taxes. This data is from our 2022 economic impact report, and it's on the BioForward website, and I do have a few copies here. So it, this question was about collaboration, but we know it's more than just that innovation. And, and you've heard it some, it's about the talent that is coming out of these, the university system. Um, Linda, she mentioned at CALS, we get so much talent coming out of that great department out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. But it is the faculties and researchers at our university system, schools that are educating and inspiring our future scientists, engineers, and business people. I have a long history of hiring this talent from not just UW-Madison. It's Eau Claire, it's Oshkosh, it's River Falls, it's Stout, it's Milwaukee, the long list in Whitewater the business people. Our industry has major partnerships throughout Wisconsin. So, you know, it wasn't just Novagen and helping us get started. This is, there's a company called Nexus Pharmaceuticals that it has their corporate headquarters in Chicago. They came to Wisconsin, established their manufacturing in Wisconsin. The, one of the major reasons is because of this university system, and now they have a major partnership with UW Parkside. We've heard about UW-Eau Claire in Mayo. Congratulations to that university and that, that partnership. These are the things that are going on, not to mention this a phenomenal partnership with GE Healthcare and the School of Medicine. From BioForward, we work with the School of Medicine and Public Health in many different projects, whether it's talent, innovation, what they're doing with clinical trials. Um, this state should have a tech hub going forward. We have the ability to do it and this university that is a, crit a critical um, relationship going forward is industry and this university working together. And I'd just like to say to, to a few of the universities over there, on March 1, we have Eau Claire, River Falls, Stout, Whitewater coming to BioForward. 
because they're reaching out saying, how can we work together? How, how can we do more to support your industry and the growth in this state? So I just like to commend a lot of these universities are reaching out to our industry and saying, what else can we do? Thank you. So for George, I know you have a lot of engagement with industry as a faculty member. Can you give an example of one of your industry partnerships and talk a little bit about the sort of work you do with companies, how that furthers your own research and uh, interests and any benefits it has Two thousand and five from chemical engineering, and I was lucky enough to come back here and become a professor here at uh, University of Wisconsin. Um, I think one nice thing at being at the university is we can do research that's five to ten years out that companies can't do because it's uh, you know they're they're looking quarter to quarter and their profits don't you know the profit structure doesn't allow them to do that. So one one industry we worked with is the plastic packaging industry in Wisconsin. I'm the director of uh, the Center for Plastic Upcycling of Waste Plastics. In Wisconsin, there's a huge packaging industry. There are 43,000 people that are employed in the packaging industry. There are 15 or 25,000 people that are employed in the flexible packaging industry. This is an example of the flexible packaging that's produced in Wisconsin. This is made by a company I drive by every day at work called EPAC that uh, they um, they, they, they print these things so you can put your beef jerky in here or your popcorn. There's, you, you probably opened this today, or you probably will open some flexible packaging in your food today. Um, huge, huge industry impact in, in the Wisconsin packaging. Um, the, these resins, these plastic resins are produced in Texas and by the railroad are shipped to Wisconsin where we use all sorts of technology to make the fancy package that goes on your store. Um, one company we've worked with is, is called Amcor. Amcor is the world's largest packaging producer. Their, their U.S. headquarters is in Nina, Wisconsin, and uh, they make some of these flexible packaging. And you, you, if you go to the grocery store now, you see a lot more of this flexible packaging than there was five, 10 years ago. They're gaining a lot of market share, and there's lots of advantages of them. Lighter weight, your food can last longer. Um, you can microwave it. You can open it up, close it, close it. Um, but there's disadvantages. The main disadvantage is you can't recycle these today. So we've developed the technology to be able to take, and, and they also generate lots of waste when they uh, produce these. There's, there's a lot of waste streams that they produce because you, you cut them and you burn, turn them into different sheets. Um, and, and we have a, developed the technology that uses solvents to be able to recycle the, 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 these flexible packaging material and the waste material. Um, we've demonstrated in the laboratory. We've sent Amcor and other companies have sent us their waste material. And in our center, we have 23 different companies we're working with. So it's very uh, industry focused about how we can best serve an industry using our research tools. So they send us our waste. We've sent them back the, the virgin resins. They said, you, 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 you're, you're, the quality of what you're making is very good. Can you give us 10 tons of it? We can't make 10 tons of it in the laboratory. We're trying to make one kilogram of it. It's taken my graduate student four months to, to do that. And so we, we've designed a pilot system to scale it up that can produce 25 kilograms an hour. And then we want to commercialize this. We have a location in Green Bay, Wisconsin, where we would take waste from Amcor and, and other plastic processors as well. We would use our technology, produce uh, 500 kilograms per hour of pure resins, send them back to the plastic converters and have kind of a closed loop recycling business. This makes business sense. We just need to demonstrate the technology. Our goal is to get this uh, commercial facility built in, in 2026, 2027. So we're three to four, five years out. Industry can't focus on this right now. We can at the university. And the other good thing is the wide range of tech, of the expertise we have at the university. You know, when you're trying to, this is a pioneer process. Nobody has done it before. And there's challenges that we face. And luckily we can always go to someone in mechanical engineering and chemistry, other professors in chemical engineering, and they can provide us with expertise about how we can solve the, some of the technical problems we're dealing with. The students work very close with the industrial partners. Uh, we go visit them, they send us material, they do analysis with us and help us provide guidance with them. Yeah, great. Thanks for talking about that impactful work. So this question is for Dan and Tom. From research collaboration to student engagement, UW partnerships with American Family Insurance and GE Healthcare are two of our most historic and comprehensive. What impacts of your organization's partnerships with the university had on the company and the broader community state? We'll start with Tom. 
Thank you. G Healthcare has about 50,000 uh, employees worldwide and give or take 6,000 here in Wisconsin. Most of the Wisconsin-based employees are highly educated. So the criticality of, of retaining and obtaining talent in this state is, is one of our most important strategic initiatives and it's, it's difficult. The University of Wisconsin system in our history in very strong passion history produces students that are smart, diverse thinkers, leaders, and those who can work hard. And it's a, it's a model that we have used for decades to build the leaders inside GE Healthcare. We take our, our responsibility to hire the best students and the best employees possible very, very seriously. And the UW system is critical to the best talent we can possibly find into our company. A good example of that was a, a program we did with, doc, with uh, Dean Samba at the business school about a year ago. Uh, the Dean came to me, I'm on the, currently sitting on the Dean's advisory board and asked us to partner with the MBA students to solve a real life business problem. So we got together a few of my leaders and we worked with the, with the MBA students for a couple of months to really assess the market of remote patient monitoring, something that's core to the business that I run in GE Healthcare. It was an incredibly rewarding experience, I think, for everyone. My leaders really got to understand what's on the minds of the students, and we got a lot of insights from the students that we candidly didn't know. You know, we've done a lot of research and hired a lot of very smart consultants around the world to help us figure out what to do in this space and spending time with the students and, and listening to their questions, some of which were incredibly basic that we probably glossed over, was a very rewarding experience. At the end of that session, the MBA students, I think, had a really good idea of how, how we think about business and how we think about serving customers and serving patients and how to make money doing it as well, having a good business model. And we learned from them how their thought process shape and how they think about uh, how they think about how to run businesses and run products. So examples like this are, are ones we want to repeat often and frequently as we can. Relationships to build with students who may become our employees someday, and also to just learn from their perspective on how to be better in our own businesses. Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned before, American Family uh, engaged in a 10-year relationship back in 2015, and you can imagine putting something together that's 10 years long is going to—it's going to change. And, and our relationship has evolved, and we had the flexibility to do that uh, along the way. And what I wanted to mention was in, in 2019, we announced an expansion of the partnership to create a UW American Family Insurance Data Science Institute. Uh, this was a, not only a commitment to its establishment, but also a commitment to fund research in data science. And I think uh, you've probably heard that word over the last couple of days. Data science is a, is a big thing. Uh, it's a very popular major at the University of Wisconsin and really across, across the country. Uh, for us, it, you know, it, specifically, the partnership recognizes the importance of data. And in, in many ways, we consider American Family a data company. There's so much data that is, as many companies are, there's so much data at companies. Um, but this data science provides us the opportunity to get insights on the challenges that our customers face and, and how to best meet them. Uh, the Institute, as we looked at the Data Science Institute, uh, will allow for the development of potential future employees uh, and graduates from the University of Wisconsin that will, will strengthen the state. Uh, it also will provide opportunities for our current employees that we do have to let them develop further by getting them involved in opportunities associated with data science. Uh, the work around data science, uh, as many companies will probably attest to, allows us to deliver customized products, pricing, programs that better meet our customers' needs and also help us deliver on our promise to be there for our customers when they need us most. I would add, as we talk about the, the Data Science Institute here, that it's not just about American family-driven research. This, there is a process in place at the Institute that goes across campus uh, soliciting opportunities to engage in data science research. It brings in other industries, not just the insurance industry. So really what we are, we're envisioning the Data Science Institute to be able to do is really 
um, for across Wisconsin and beyond is to be able to train and develop and, and produce research that allows companies to successfully grow their businesses. So we're excited, excited about that. I will mention that the Data Science Institute is gonna be a prominent piece of a building that's now under construction, the, the CDIS building a block or so away from here. So uh, we're excited about that. We're excited about uh, what UW uh, is producing in terms of data science expertise out there. And we're happy to be able to support that um, and for mutual benefit for both parties. Thank you. So we have a follow-up. So any partnership can be improved. Um, so this is your chance to tell us how you'd like to see higher ed institutions focus on improving that university business engagement partnership process. So Dan, you've got the mic. Sure. Uh, yeah, so uh, American Family does have partnerships across many other institutions. In fact, we work with uh, Whitewater, we work with uh, Green Bay, we have a, a Do things with other other uh, schools outside of Wisconsin, um, but if I were to think about what could be done better, I I, I would mention three things. Okay, um, that could be done, and some of it is already in place here. I think the single point of contact that we have with the Office of Business Education uh, Engagement is really a strong point of of a relationship. Um, a university is is tough to navigate, just like a large business is. And having that single point of contact really is, is beneficial. Uh, the second thing that I would mention, and this has evolved in our partnership over the over the seven eight years it's been underway thus far, is more of a mutual benefit approach. You know, when we came in, it was all how are we going to make American Family be better here, and and we, in some respects, the university was about research. How can we have that integrate better so that both groups can have a mutual benefit from that sort of interaction? And then somewhat related to that, the third thing that I would say is as uh, in terms of an overall improvement, and again, it's getting it's great what we have, uh, but at other places we're not seeing it quite as strong. And that's the, the concept of a the mindset mindset is a partnership mindset. Tom mentioned it briefly, you know. We're partners, we're not a vendor. And that goes both ways. You know, from American Family Spot, you're not just a vendor for us. From University of Wisconsin, we're not just a vendor to you. So it's a, it's a mindset partnership, a mindset about partnership. There's going to be some give and take. It's not always about uh, who's going to win. It's a partnership. So I think that mindset is important. So those are the, the, the three things I would mention as possible ways to enhance it. Thank you. No, Dan, I, I would only add a few things that you said, and it, it, it reiterate, I should say, it, it really has to be a, a balanced equation. I think to be sustainable, it, it has there has to be a clear return for the university as well as in our company. Um, what, what, what do we ultimately, what are the outcomes that, that both of us can, will achieve as a result of it? A, a one way, you know, something that's great for us or great for, for the university, um, individually doesn't usually sustain. You know, I think our, our, our position with the School of Medicine and Public Health is a perfect example of that. I mean, we need, literally need each other. It's not about we're, we're going over to University to Madison to, to help Dr. Grist. I mean, it, it, that's in the equation, but it's, he's helping, he's helping us. And when you find those relationships that are, you find those, those pockets that the, the equation's very balanced, it, 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 it's a cliche, but it's a, it's a complete win-win and you know it's going to last. And they, they, and they grow. They start with something and then they just grow and grow and grow based on the mutual need of both parties. And it just becomes a, a balanced uh, partnership that the, the, the ROI, if you will, is perfect on both sides. So just more, more of the same with Dan said. Okay, thank you. We're going to switch back to Lisa and George. So you're both experienced in translating university research and discoveries into commercialized products and new business startups. Talk about what UW-Madison and other higher ed institutions in the state are doing well in this process and how we could better support university-affiliated entrepreneurs and startups. George, you want to go? 
Can you go first? Yeah, I'd like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, my experience is really with Pyran. Um, we, we, we first got started, uh, you know, I had a graduate student who had a technology that I thought had commercial viability. I said, would you be interested in, you know, starting a company with me? And I told him, you know, maybe it's best for you to go get a job at Dow Chemical or a large chemical company and do that rather than be an entrepreneur. You know, the entrepreneurs really take a risk. And he said, oh, no, I, I want to start the company, you know, and so we, 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 you know, we had IP and, and the university protected the IP. Wharf is very good at protecting the IP. Then uh, we went through, so, so then we went through the Wharf Accelerator Fund program that gives you funding. And he stayed on my lab with a year. And I said, you're, you know, your job is to make samples and we're going to form a business plan and start turning this into a business. And, uh, and he, you know, did a fabulous job with that. He's, he's still, he, now he's the CTO of, of Pyran, Kevin Barnett. Um, we went through the, the D2P program who kind of helped us put together a business plan. There's the, we, we applied for SBIR for support. We got support from the, the uh, I can't remember the name of the office. It helped us put together our SBIR proposal, CTC, yeah, thank you. Helped us put together our SBIR proposal. Uh, we went through the G-Beta program, another accelerator program that told us how to pitch. We got some uh, Wisconsin Economic Development Council gave us some funding. We got some local investors as angel investors and, uh, you know, now now we're raising our Series B round of funding, and we have some. That's kind of how we grew grew the business. Um, it was taking advantage of local expertise. Um, the, the the other big advantage we've had at Pyran compared to Anellotech is we're very close. We're here in Madison. We know all the students. You know, I teach them in my classes. I know the really good ones, and it's very easy to recruit. You know, top quality students to work at Pyran. And so the, you know, the, the quality of the people you hire for a small company, that's very hard because we don't have the resources of a GE. Mm -hmm. You know, the entrepreneur should, it's, it's all about taking risks. And there's a lot of risks those people take when they join the company because they know, you know, you probably have one six to 18 months of funding before, you know, you need to raise the next round. So, you know, that stability is not there, but they, they enjoy that and they enjoy the risk and they enjoy you know, seeing the technology develop. I those were a lot of acronyms, uh, George. Is, did you guys need a definition of any of the SBIR, uh, WARF? Uh, Are you good? See, I'm new to Wisconsin, too, so I'm, you know. Okay. Lisa, thank you, George. So first, you you have to understand how difficult this is to be a faculty member and start a, job, start a company. I can't imagine having another job besides starting a company. Um, and I just want to give him so much credit for this. It is so hard to be an entrepreneur. Um, you know, you live the life of no money. Um, you are trying to raise money. You, you were trying to go through all these programs just to get this company going. Um, I personally guarantee loans. You're always on the edge and you're in this constant state of change and just how can, where's the next way we can get this company going or is this going to is it going to make it? So I just want to put that out there, that congratulations to him and any companies that are coming out. Uh, you know, this university, you mentioned several of it in some of the state programs. I'd just like to say I did implement that SBIR matching grant program when I was at WDC because we need to do whatever we can in the state and the university. One party that's missing here today is the government. And I'm talking to both political parties when I say this. Other states... South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Pennsylvania. The government is backing their universities and industry collaborations because, and I'm speaking from our industry, the only, they see, you saw that, you heard my data. They know the data. They know how impactful this industry is. Everybody wants GE healthcare. They come together. effort with this state and this university. It drives me insane. As I told you, this is a disclaimer. I will tell you openly what I believe is that if we don't get out there and start telling this nation what is going on in this state, entrepreneurs like him, it is much more difficult. As much as I hated the pandemic and I hated getting COVID, the great thing that came out of the pandemic for entrepreneurs is that VCs no longer said, Sorry, you can't stay in Wisconsin. You got to move to San Francisco or Boston. That is not the case anymore. It costs three to four times at least more to start his company in California than it does in the state of Wisconsin. VCs do not want their equity diluted. 
They want the company staying here. They have no problem getting on Zoom now, all right? So the, my big thing is let's make it easier. Start marketing. And governments are coming together behind this university and this university also wake up. We're telling you how great the partnerships is. It's not perfect, right? We all know it, come on, it is not perfect. We can always do more. The chancellor brought it up, we can do more. So let's start doing it and start getting aggressive. If those other states, South Carolina, if we cannot beat that with this major university and these outstanding education systems, the companies are coming here, start helping this entrepreneur and start marketing it. So VC start recognizing these great companies that are coming out of here and making it easy on it, rewarding people like him. I, I think it's great research publications, but we reward people like George that it can be a great faculty member and an entrepreneur. And then also invest. I just wanna compliment, you know, there's entities like UW-Milwaukee, they're doing so much to help entrepreneurs. Um, in Madison, um, you have the Forward Bio Institute, the Law and Entrepreneurship Clinic, and then we developed Forward Bio Labs. This was this university, Dr. Bill Murphy, coming together with our industry, getting a shared lab space, getting to started in the university research park. So companies, maybe like a George, more in our life science industry can start, maybe fail, it's okay, maybe fail, but get up at a launching ground, things are paid for, then they go out into the marketplace. So I think those are the big things. We gotta do more, I told you I'm passionate. Um, I'm 61. I don't care anymore, right? Let's start competing. Let's start competing. From this university, our government and our industry can do more. Let's not attack one another. Let's start coming together like the rest of these states, Republican and Democrat. It does not matter the political party. They understand the value of their university systems. And it's about time this state starts to understand it as well. Thank you. I, I yeah. And I, I think we need to recruit you for another job here. Um, Dean Gillespie, I wonder if I could break in here and ask if Regents have questions or comments okay. for our panel. Yes, Regent Jones. Well, thank you very, thank you very much. Um, it was an excellent presentation and I hope that this is not the first time or the last time we, we see you and, and have this conversation because I'm a big advocate of public private partnerships because they can be a win-win um, and who doesn't like that. Um, but it does seem like we're really late to the game on private partnerships and public private partnerships. And I'm kind of curious as to why you think that is. Um, and I'm not looking to blame anyone or blame anything. I'm kind of trying to get at what are some of the obstacles. And, and, and Dan, you addressed some of those obstacles. For example, it should be a single point of contact. Well, that should be reasonably easy enough for us to do, right? We should change the contractual policy that we have as a Board of Regents because it's really meddlesome and bureaucratic. And so, okay, that we can do. But then you talk about mindset, changing the mindset of um, this mindset should be one of mutuality, mutual benefit, and the mindset should be of partnership. Um, and so you have any advice for us as a Board of Regents, how can we get at those sorts of things, the mindsets, which I think are much harder to change than a policy or a procedure? I guess I'll start, and thank you for that question. Um, you know, I'll just make an observation about the panel. One thing that, that came out to me was that UW and the entire system can benefit a variety of entities from startup to old school like us who started in 1927 to GE Healthcare, who was very much in the, in the tech space. Uh, I, I think much of it is inertia. Um, uh, it's uh, ownership, wanting to own things. You know, I, I think about our working with UW. I'm working with UW. So there needs to be a little bit of, of a shared pride in the relationship. And that, I think, can go across both the corporate perspective and also the, the, the university where uh, university, oh, I'm working with American Family. No, I'm working with them. So I think it needs to be more of a shared um, pride in in that relationship so you know how do you make that happen you know 
is that part of a message that can get delivered? Um, can there be rewards, incentives? I, you know, I don't know if that's as available in the academic world. Uh, it's probably not, but um, you know, that would be my first comment uh, on that. Just, just to add a couple things, I, I don't, I don't know if we're late, but I think with everything, you wonder if we're optimized, and if we're, are we doing is what we can do better. Um, it, as I mentioned earlier, when you find the equation that it's a home run on both sides, it usually is sustainable. It, and as basic as it it sounds, I think consistency of leadership on both sides, when that lacks, it it, it doesn't go well. And and you know I think we we all live in a world of revolving door re with respect to talent, but the that has been in at least in my experience it's been it's been somewhat of our of our limiter is do we have this a consistent group of individuals and I mentioned several times our relationship with the uh, the medical school and and we've had consistent leadership and certainly here um, and then it's um, some cases where we haven't been as good we haven't had consistent leadership on our side so. That, that's a that's a key element. Continuity of leadership. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or comments from Regents? Yes, Regent Atwell. Thank you, Regent President uh, Walsh. Um, Lisa, have you ever thought of running for public office? <laughs> you know, I would get in trouble. <laughs> Sometimes I think we need a little trouble. <laughs> but um, one thing that uh, I served on the Ready Committee. Uh, for a number of years. And one thing that we um, seemed to run up against, which I, I couldn't really sift through whether it was perception or reality, but there was concern expressed by entrepreneurs that the Wisconsin understanding of conflict of interest was an impediment to um, commercializing the intellectual property that is generated in the university. Is that is that a myth or is that, and and have we really compared um, our understanding of those things with uh, places like South Carolina or California or or other places that are that are competing in this space. Yeah, I, I think the conflict of interest. You know, Could you move closer to the mic, sorry. please, Professor? So I've, I've gone so through the conflict of interest committee, and we do it every year. It's kind of a routine thing. Uh, I think the rules are very fair. You know, we just need to make sure we disclose everything. Um, with 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 co any potential conflicts and you know follow the rules the university has set up. I think it's a very nice and easy to use system. So I'm not con too concerned about conflict of interest. My real concern with conflict of interest is when you if if you go to a conference in another country and then they pay for your funding, then the feds might come after you. And uh, you know China now is sponsoring lots of research. So that's another concern that probably is more. Uh, a larger concern than the, the entrepreneurship and working with companies or something like that. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just make a quick comment on that too. You know, our, our relationship is broad across many areas, but I mentioned data science earlier, and we were definitely um, clear in, in establishing some IP type sort of um, guidelines, because if you've got, we've got folks at American Family that would like to take some credit for IP, and certainly the university's got a lot of talent that would want uh, and deserve that IP credit. So that is one area that we have paid particular attention to, especially in the technical areas, uh, and making sure that that has been, been laid out properly. Thank you. Okay, Regent Bechtel. Yeah, um, Lisa, you got me fired up, so <laughs> thank you. Um, and, and really a question for anybody on the panel. So I've represented a number of companies that are either coming to the state, um, you know, we love to bring in Illinois companies. So Nexus is a great example of that. And, and I guess I'm wondering from a business perspective, what are some more useful tools for the government to attract uh, companies? So right now, it seems like in the toolkit, we have TIF uh, on the local side uh, to help with property tax relief. On the state side, it's a pretty uh, crude set of tools that the state of Wisconsin is currently using. Um, you're going to get a sales tax rebate. Um, you can get some corporate income tax rebate. Uh, we measure things on your CapEx uh, investment, and we measure things on number of employees, which is really not going to help a small startup, right? So it seems to me, and I've negotiated these things with WDC, and if anything, it's become more restrictive over the last couple of years in terms of their, the government's willingness to kind of step forward. 
And I know, you know, Tom, your company is a great example of a of a of a a company here that we really can grow in Wisconsin. And we've heard yesterday about the life sciences uh, uh, piece as well. So just are there other things that the government can be doing to help you either start a company or keep a company or grow a company like GE Healthcare here in the state? So um, I have a couple comments on that, just and it's really more recent. Um, so the first one is I mentioned Forward Bio Lab. So when a company, especially in our industry, so let's say they're coming out of Madison Technology, we take them to Forward Bio Labs to start, right? Uh, then, and we're seeing this multiple times over and over again, they're starting to grow. And the whole idea is you leave that lab space, then you're graduating. There is nowhere to go. There is no lab space. Now, here's the great thing. It's because our industry is booming in this state. So all the bigger companies are gobbling up anything they can, right, as they're expanding here. But we need is that program. So just as you're saying companies come in here, we're also hearing that companies want to come here, but they want to go into existing lab space. For developers, you just can't do a spec building on lab space and go, oh, I hope someone's going to take this. It's different for housing or some off, well, not office space anymore, but for housing, it's different. We would love to see some type of grant program, especially going maybe towards the tenant side, that that's, can support them in that buildup because they cannot afford, you know, if George was a lab and he had to take 10, 15,000 square feet and have to pay for all that buildup, you can't do it. You're still that early stage and having to put that type of money more towards a lab than product development. So I do think there's some innovative program out there that we need to work with the state on that I think is for a track can help with attraction and emerging growth. We have an R&D tax credit that um, refundability of that. It's at around, I think it's 15% right now. I think mo the more that we can do that, that's not just for large companies, that's for smaller companies as well, because it's a refundability. If we can increase that, I think that helps uh, greatly. So it's those kinds of efforts. Um, but I just want to go back to that marketing one more time, is that it's those are government, right? But I still think the major investment our government needs to do is start marketing these industries, key industries in the state alongside this university. I already mentioned it with all those states. It is changing perception, right? It is a perception that is out there. There's nothing happening in Wisconsin. That's why I have to go to those other states I mentioned. And it's all around their marketing. They are just marketing. Because we do have some great, pro we have some good programs in Wisconsin. We have good support for entrepreneurs. But it's a it's flipping that switch for talent and companies out there on what is actually happening here. And we have not made that investment in marketing and trying to change that perception. We need to get, you know, a little more arrogant here. Let's, you know, let's put that out there. So I think those two programs along with the marketing investment. Thank you. I'm going to turn to President Rothman. I think you had a... I, I did. I just wanted to thank the, the panelists. I mean, this has been terrific to see the partnerships and your commitment to, to our universities. Lisa, I'd just like to follow up uh, with, with you, and I think you hit on it a little bit in terms of marketing, but as we approach uh, the budget season and going to the legislature, and I grew up in this state, and at the, at, when I was growing up, I certainly had the sense that education was a bipartisan issue. Um, I think we, we struggle... acknowledge that uh, in transparency, but what would your suggestion be to us in terms of how we better work with the business community to in turn then talk to the legislature uh, who, who in good faith want to promote Wisconsin, want to make sure that Wisconsin is economically viable, but the universities play such a critical role in that, that message doesn't seem to be getting through as clearly as it should. What would you tell us and how can we better partner with you in terms of talking to the legislature about the investments in, in these institutions. Okay, I'll go one more time quickly because I'll let the other guys talk, but I love, I love the mic. Um, okay, so I would tell them what I've already told you. You go to them and this is about business. This university gets it. We provide the innovation. We cannot do it alone. We cannot do our own R&D from the industry. We need the university. We have to have the talent. We, I'm tired of migration out reports. They've, they, we all read it. Doesn't matter what party you're in. We've read the migration out. You want migration in, you need an industry like ours. It keeps the talent here. It attracts the talent here. It is all about. Um, 
infrastructure. We absolutely need that UW engineering school. We are dependent on our supply chain in the state. Those engineers do not just come to our industry and GE Healthcare, they go to the supply chain throughout the state. We are highly dependent on that. And I would love to see that phase two. I know UW Eau Claire is also looking at their phase two of their science and how science is building. They have a major partnership with Mayo. What more do we have to present? This is about, we are having those connections. That's what I would say to the legislators, R&D, innovation, invest in our infrastructure. You know, maybe to, to add to Lisa's points, to put some, some numbers around that. If you think of that in our industry, the healthcare industry, and you look at the percentage of GDP spent in healthcare, it's enormous. Upper teens in this country and, and growing around the world. GE Healthcare's impact, roughly speaking, in the state of Wisconsin is around $8 billion. With all the suppliers, all the jobs we have, and the as I mentioned earlier, these are all educated jobs, hundred thousand dollar year plus roles in our industry. So, the 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 future of healthcare, the problems in healthcare, and the investments needed in this space to grow a, a vibrant life sciences industry in the state of Wisconsin has a massive impact on the state overall. Solving major problems in our health industry today. Which is which is we all live with is is very personal, and the impact on growing this industry to the state. I think you, as I mentioned, it's the, the numbers are significant today, and they will be even larger in the future. Thank you. Uh, we are out of time at this point. Uh, thank you so much to our panel, to Chancellor Manukin for coming in today. I'm sure you'll be hearing from us again as we work together to help solve Wisconsin's workforce and mm -hmm. entrepreneurship questions. Thank you so much. And now we're gonna turn our attention to a topic that we tremendously enjoy and respect, but probably don't spend enough time on, and that is educator appreciation. President Rothman, I think you would like to say a few words. I, I would, and, and thank you very much, uh, Region President Walsh. Um, we've heard a lot of really great things, I think, this morning, uh, and they all start uh, at the end of the day in the classroom with our universities, and we wanna acknowledge that. Uh, during our 100 Stories and 100 Days project over this past summer, we repeated a faculty member influenced their educational experience and in a lot of cases change the trajectory of their lives. As we advocate for state support in our UW system biennial budget request, it is essential that we demonstrate the value of what the system and its schools do, both for individuals and for the state of Wisconsin. And who better to tell that story than our students? Over the last several months, we sent a video team out to all 13 universities to collect interviews with students to hear the real stories of how a faculty member or some other staff member made a difference. During the course of about two hours at each of our universities, we interviewed hundreds of students. Today, we'll see a montage of those videos that get to the heart of what a UW educational experience is all about. I'm gonna tell you up front that this, one, this uh, tape is a little longer than our normal video productions but showcasing our outstanding faculty and staff didn't seem like the place to give short shrift. There are a number of things that you will hear over and over. And you'll hear that in this video as well. And we've included some of that repetition to highlight the common themes that many of our students identified. You'll hear repeatedly students talking about the commitment and compassion of their professors and others and how it truly makes a difference. How these educators make a subject matter unexpectedly humorous or understandable or relatable to the real world. You hear about men and women who give of their time and experience to help their students succeed, both inside the classroom and beyond. I can almost guarantee you one thing, you're going to be proud to be part of a place that fosters these kinds of individuals and educational experiences. And we are so very fortunate to have such dedicated educators as part of our UW system. So with that, let's roll the video, please.
Roll the video with sound. How, with how sound. about that? <laughs> um, <laughs> Shout out to I want to shout out 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 I enjoy doing every single class. It just like it makes us super fun. All the time. Keeping us entertained and engaged. It makes the last one engaging. Class enjoyable. And enjoyable to learn. It always makes math something enjoyable, which I've actually struggled with since God freshman year of high school. Because you know, it's maybe not the most fun part of the whole time. But he definitely makes it fun in the way he teaches, and he's very engaging. The thing is, I don't really like this story, but she's actually made it really interesting, and she's so funny. It's so funny. It makes the class super bearable. Um, his classes have always been uh, stimulating to me, and I had a really good time in those, and they've actually sparked my interest for further schooling and all. He has added to this year. And he made it just such a fun, like, topic to learn about. He made me actually really love geography. I've never taken a geography class before. He's an amazing teacher. She's just amazing. And he is amazing. He's done everything and everything he can. And Cash loves his work. He's he's very uplifting. Oh, he's so nice. He brings such a positive energy. He's so very hard to teach. He's my mental health and mental health. And he is super positive. Great professor here. He's super knowledgeable and super passionate about teaching, helping students, he's being really helpful in the classroom. She's always doing the extra um and they just do a great job of making everyone who involved in the class and it just makes them quite well nice and i cannot thank her enough like making one on campus she made me feel very comfortable in her class and going to see her just to help me more into the community and she makes me more comfortable in that department since that's like my least like what the best lesson she's really awesome she's always there for students questions about you know, not just what i want to do with my career but you know guidance about personal stuff and how to how to navigate being a model and all that sort of thing that's really about her mental health that's what we're also taking in this class she was also there and like supported me through like a really hard time my freshman year and she walks through the halls He's really understanding going to about anything in class or outside of class. She gets it. She's very, very real with us. And he's super supportive. And we'll talk about anything you mentioned. He's just helping a lot of classes in life in general. Well, they have this talk to She's always there for me. She's always there for me. I'm very proud of always there for the students. He has always been there for us. I like not going for anything. Pretty much go in there and talk about anything you want. He's always so unbelievably helpful and kind. He's always been so patient and he's been so kind and so supportive. And I've really seen myself improve and he's been so many great coaches. He's changed my perspective on everything for the better and how he impacts so many students' lives. Having the best of us has really, really changed things. Uh, he has changed my life in many ways. Just to help me out as a student. Super instrumental in like my development here. Just made me a better person, a better musician, a uh, better student overall. Be the best person possible. But he really is looking for student success all the time. And that was when I learned you're taking free calc with him or advanced health for him. Like he is most possibly to help anybody out. Very apparent that she wants you to succeed. And she always makes herself available. And he always comes back to my mind whenever I want to help us. So I'm saying that going up with Michael Sowers and just really getting the concept down. He's really willing to just help She always, she makes sure every student uh, knows exactly what they're doing. And gives you a little bit of stuff about them too. I submitted my in progress drawing to her. I didn't expect like a few uh, responses of things I could improve, but I got a whole markup of my drawing that looks like she's been hours on it, making comments and revisions. And it's really great. The way she delivers content is really memorable, and she just has a lot of stories to help us learn. She has some great uh, real life stories that really help us to apply um concepts that we are learning in class to what we might be experiencing in our future bringing the material back into like before each new concept he makes 
everything in a very understandable in a real life way, it teaches us a bunch of skills that we can use not only in class, but just in life in general. Gave us a lot of our good study methods. I made a class that was advised by a really hard body of law from the other students. The way she used to ask 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 She's very good at explaining things, and even as soon as I'm struggling with this class, I feel like I can learn from her. She's still, she's still a great resource. She's not going to have time just to kind of help me through a hard time. I was talking about my major, doubts I'm having about the future and that kind of thing. And she really helped me get on the course and look at my graduation of the fire balance. So I think without her help, like I wouldn't be able to be in a major that I really love now. I wouldn't be able to study the things I want to do. So she really helped me with that. And switch my majors and encourage me to. Which is the reason why I intended to enjoy economics. He encouraged me to think critically and made me confident in my decision to change my major. I wasn't confident that I could finish. As a writer, he encouraged me to submit some journey magazines. He gave me incredible feedback. He helped me to push my brain. He's super passionate about um, the fields and he always shows that like, he's open in the field, which is really nice. Session, but like you could trust him that he had enough effort and he would be open to whatever I'm interested in doing and then also for me on projects as well so that we can continue to like well build my market. It's always on top of new technologies yeah first of all getting us uh, new updated information on stuff like that going kind of through Research studies and everything like that and really diving deep for us as students so we can learn and learn as much as possible. Of course, work is somewhat difficult, but when it comes down to it, it's been some of the most useful things I've used out in industry and here on campus. Challenge was some of the things to see. I'm just going to be great with business and experiment for the entrepreneurial health space. It's ready to go out into the world now because of her. We have gotten some real life industry type projects and getting us in contact with people in the industry and help us. I got uh, even in connection. Figuring out what jobs I'm going to do. Like, like helping me find my internships and writing my letters of recommendation. And then he went about the other day and had this great Be the best teacher for this. Yeah. 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 I really appreciate them. Like, every experience has been, been, just been awesome. It's just a great year. In our first semester of college, it's just great. Thank you. 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 be totally anonymous in terms of who they were talking about. What you're seeing up on the screen right now are the names of the nearly 200 educators from every university in the system who were singled out by the students we interviewed as someone who had made a significant difference to them. And we are very aware that this is just a sampling of the great talent on the UW system team. We actually could have made this video much longer, but I think you get the idea. I should point out that this is just the beginning of our shout out to educators storytelling campaign. Starting next week, we will be sharing at least one individual story per day, about 200 stories overall on our social media channels. I encourage you to check them out at hashtag UW shout out. I mentioned earlier how fortunate we are to have such incredible educators as part of the UW system. And yes, we are fortunate but we need to do more than just count ourselves as being lucky in order to continue to make the UW system an attractive place for such talented and dedicated people to practice their craft. To maintain and build on our reputation for excellence, we must recruit and retain educators and researchers, the best educators and researchers out there. Our students and our state deserve nothing less. To that end, a major platform of our strategic plan is to promote excellence in teaching. And a key component of that is, in, is increasing overall compensation for system faculty and staff. We must be competitive with our peers, and that will require us to enhance benefits and to deliver salary increases. It is part of our biennial budget request. Well, many educators often say their best reward 
comes from seeing their students succeed. And you could see that on this video. We also know that they deserve more and we are trying our best to make sure that they get that. So with that, President Walsh, I will turn it back to you. And I will echo your thoughts on uh, doing better with compensation for our uh, teachers, faculty, and staff. Now it's time for one of our most enjoyable responsibilities as board, and that is the presentation of Region Awards. Today, we present the 15th Annual Regents Diversity Awards, where we run Honor these individuals for the support and opportunities they offer our students. To lead us in the awards presentation, I will turn the floor over to the chair of the Awards Selection Committee, Regent Hector Colon. There you go. Thank you, uh, President um, Terry Walsh. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here to present uh, the Diversity Awards. Uh, good morning, uh, buenos dias. On behalf of my colleagues, I offer a special welcome uh, to this year's award recipients. We also welcome their families, friends, and colleagues who have joined us this morning uh, in person or virtually. Thank you so much for being here. This is the 15th year that the Board of Regents has presented the Diversity Awards, which are meant to recognize the outstanding contributions to diversity and inclusion by people and programs at our UW universities. These are ideals that the UW system has promoted for decades. Today's awards are part of a special family of awards that we as Regents sponsor. They also include the Regents Teacher Excellence Awards and the Region University Staff Excellence Awards, which recognize exceptional service. The Regents Diversity Awards program, which we present here this morning, was established through a board directive calling for the formal recognition of individuals, teams, or units within the UW system who have successfully fostered greater access <coughs> and success for historically underrepresented populations. At this time, I would like to recognize the commitment of my region colleagues who have served on the selection committee for this year's awards. And that includes Regent, uh, Regent uh, Angela Adams, Regent Ashok Rai, and Regent uh, Brianna Tucker. Uh, it was a great time to spend with you as we look through these applications some great applications. So thank you so much for being a part of that process. I appreciate the work of those who have supported the committee, uh, staff and faculty, your, your work does not go unnoticed. Thank you so much for all you did to get us here today. I also wanna thank all the nominees for their important contributions and taking the time to submit the materials. Before we present this year's award winners, I would like to acknowledge the other nominees by reading their names and in institutions. And please forgive me and even call me out if I mispronounce your name, uh, because I know that's important. I know I don't like when people call me Hector Colon, uh, so I understand. <laughs> <laughs> the individual names uh, nominees included include Megan Stralo uh, from UW Green Bay, Laura Franklin, from UW Platteville, Judy Young from UW Stevens Point, and Dr. Pilar Malero from UW Whitewater. Program nominees include UW Madison's People Program, UW Stevens Point School of Biology, Chemistry and Biochemistry. Along with this impressive, proud, Along with this impressive pool of nominees, we are pleased to recognize the accomplishments of this year's recipients, and we're proud that they are a part of the UW system familia. Before we present the awards, 
I'd like to point out that the profiles of our award winners are available online. I encourage you to read them at your leisure. I'm sure you will be impressed, but you will also appreciate the significant contributions that they have in advancing equity, diversity, and inclusion. My colleagues on the Region Selection Committee will each introduce one of the award recipients and present the award. Each recipient will then have an opportunity to make brief remarks. I will present the first award. It is my privilege to present the first Board of Region Diversity Award in the individual category to Dr. Ricky uh, Ann Legname. Dr. Leg Leitner holds a, a number of titles, Associate Professor of English, Advisor of Women's Gender and Sexual Studies, Inclusive Excellence Action uh, Plan Coordinator, and last but not least, Interim Executive Director for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. She has been recognized for outstanding contributions as a teacher, a scholar, an LGBT individual and advocate, generously offering her time and expertise to the university and the UW system colleagues while serving as an advocate and advisor for students. Dr. Legneitner uh, coordinated with UW Stout leadership to create an equity, diversity, and inclusion unit and an office for the university. She helped develop an EDI team, which represents from each campus governance group to ensure campus feedback. She also oversaw a major initiative to expand EDI professional development at UW Stout in the summer of 2021. About 100 faculty and staff have enrolled in the resulting EDI Canvas modules, and more than 125 have participated in or in person workshops. Dr. Legneitner has published and presented wor her work to a national audience and taught courses in multiple units while balancing department service and student advising. She revised the Women's Gender and Sexual Studies minor and recruits and advises students as an advisor for the program. She is a leader in the UW System Women's and Gender Studies Consortium and has worked at UW Stout Menard Center for the study of institutions and innovation to expand work on initiatives around freedom of expression. In 2022, she earned the Enterprising Woman Recognition by the national publication, Tag Magazine. Chancellor Catherine, uh, Catherine Frank describes our awardee this way, quote, Dr. Legneitner is a passionate, courageous, dedicated, and authentic professional who impacts students, colleagues, and university partners on a daily basis. It is my pleasure to present our first uh, Regents uh, Diversity Award to Dr. Ricky Ann, um, like Nightner, please come up. Oh my goodness, y'all. Okay. So, good morning. Representation matters. When I was 11, I was first diagnosed with depression and generalized anxiety. At this delicate time, I was also coming to understand my sexuality as a queer woman. To make up what I was taught to achieve in everything else, in academics, in my work, and masking my true self. 
And this motivation to make up for what was lacking, combined with my own intellectual curiosity, helped propel me forward into college and into graduate school. And throughout that journey, I so rarely encountered anyone who resembled me. No one openly discussed mental health. And sexuality all too often seemed like a piece of gossip rather than a point of pride. And as I learned more about identity in my research in American literature and in gender studies, and as I became more comfortable in the classroom with a few years of teaching experience, I made the decision to become the person I never had. And I began to openly discuss my depression and anxiety, first in office hours when students sought help and support, and then in my classes when we discussed support services or when we talked about identity and social and cultural constructs. I eventually outed myself in the classroom for the first time at UW Stout in order to more openly support students. Who had been hard. I know that I have privilege and that many of my marginalized identities are invisible. Yet I have never regretted the risk and vulnerability I've taken in order to better support students who may have felt like I did in my 20s. That success would not find them if they lived their truth, and that staying alive in and of itself was an accomplishment. I am lucky that when I came out professionally, I found support from a majority of my friends and colleagues. However, I also experienced microaggressions and outright bias. I have lost people who I thought were allies. That ongoing loss will always be worth what I have gained personally and what that authenticity has allowed me to accomplish professionally in supporting student success. I also use the privilege I have to continually learn how to better advocate for those who should be in the room. If we genuinely want to close achievement gaps, we have to re-examine our hiring and admission policies, and we have to consider how we can effectively recruit, support, and retain historically underserved and not just be a checkbox. And we cannot treat it like a trend. Diversity is here to stay. We have to genuinely invest in inclusion and equity efforts at every level. We have to look at our policies and procedures and begin to dismantle systems that would oppress rather than offer us the freedom that education should provide. If we are to remain viable and innovative, we must be leaders in making these changes. And we must continually challenge ourselves personally and professionally and hold ourselves accountable when we fail and when we can do better. As is often said in EDI work, we all benefit when not everyone only has a seat at the same old table, but when we can all give input about how we might build a new and better table. Representation matters, but so does inclusion. The kind of belonging that means everyone can bring their genuine selves and help construct a better future. Um, I want to thank the Board of Regents for this recognition, and I want to thank Chancellor Catherine Frank and everyone at UW-Stout who has supported the efforts and the mission of the EDI unit. Um, I also want to thank Stephanie Rolati, his consortium. Um, equity, diversity, and inclusion work is a, always a collaborative effort. And this award would not be possible without the larger UW Stout and Wisconsin communities. I am incredibly honored and humbled to receive this recognition on behalf of these communities. Thank you. Congratulations again to Dr. Leg Leitner. And thank you, Regent President Walsh, for the honor and the privilege to serve on this committee alongside with my colleagues, Regent Cologne, Rye, and Tucker. Our second Regents Diversity Award in the individual category goes to Lori Quito Lopez, Professor of Communication Arts and Director of Asian 
American Studies program at UW. Madison, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Her research and teaching focus on ways disenfranchised communities use media to promote empowerment and social justice, focusing primarily on Asian Americans. Dr. Lopez has overseen significant student growth as director of UW Madison's Asian American Studies program. She has prioritized faculty recruitment by hiring early education scholars into tenure track faculty roles. She also has been instrumental in supporting the university's Asian Pacific Islander and Desi American Student Center, which serves hundreds of students each year. As co-chair of the Campus Diversity and Climate Committee and co-chair of the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee for the College of Letters and Science, Dr. Lopez developed new diversity, equity, and inclusion reporting mechanisms to help build a campus culture of accountability and continual improvement, including a climate survey. She advocated to strengthen UW-Madison's ethnic studies requirement, student understanding of multiple dimensions of diversity. She has written books on race and the media, including an ethnographic study of how Hmong Americans engage with media. Her recognitions include the 2020 Chancellor's Inclusive Excellence Award, which honors UW-Madison distinguished teaching. In the nomination materials, Chancellor Jennifer, Jennifer Manukin offered this reflection on the impact of our awardees' work, quote, Dr. Lopez has made transformative, meaningful, and inspired commitments to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and richly deserves to be recognized for her commitment and successes, end quote. On that note, it is my pleasure to present the second Regents Diversity Award to Dr. Lori Quito Lopez at UW-Madison. Thank you so much for this award. Um, thank you so much to the Board of Regents. It's a huge honor and I am humbled to receive it. I have so many amazing colleagues all across campus who are important partners in all of my diversity, equity and inclusion work. I see this award as a recognition of their partnership and support because of course no one does this work alone. So just to name a few, I'd really like to thank my Dean Eric Wilcox and my colleague Devon Wilson in the College of Letters and Science, as well as Derek Johnson and Lindsay Stoddard Cameron for all of their support for me personally and for DEI initiatives more broadly. I also see this award as recognition of the important place of Asian Americans on this campus. I'm so proud to be the director of the Asian American Studies program, which is celebrating its 35th year on campus. Not only does our program support the academic study of Asian Americans and offer classes about Asian American histories and cultures, but it reminds students of Asian descent every day that they belong on this campus, that their histories and cultures are valued. In a moment when Asians and Asian Americans are facing violence of all kinds, it is so important to help recognize and provide support for programs like ours, and indeed all of our ethnic studies programs whose scholarly work is so valuable. I'm also proud to be at a university that has had an ethnic studies requirement since 1994, because we know that spending an entire semester in a class that focuses on studying race and racism can be transformative, that when our students are doing readings by scholars of color, asking how histories of racism are connected to our contemporary realities or having challenging conversations with their fellow classmates every week, they are better equipped to understand their place in society and what steps they might take to contribute to justice and equality when they graduate. 
I hope that we can continue to think about how to increase the impact of these important courses in our curriculum. Finally, I'd like to thank my husband, Jason, for being the best partner I could ever ask for. I'd also like to thank Chancellor Manukin for nominating me for this award. I look forward to continuing this important work alongside the other awardees and finding new ways to amplify the many DEI initiatives that are changing our university communities for the better. Thank you. Congratulations again, Dr. Lopez, and I am honored to present the third Regents Diversity Award in the program category to the Upward Bound Program at UW River Falls. The Upward Bound Program started at UW River Falls in 1999. As one of the university's longest running programs, it focuses on preparing diverse populations for college readiness. Under its current director, B. Vang, the program cultivates a network of peers, professionals, and community members to leverage support and high-impact practices that help students succeed at, at the college level prior to arriving on a college campus. Participants enter the four-year program as ninth graders who are encouraged to identify and bond with supportive and trusting peer groups. Within this positive peer support, the program emphasizes leadership development, career and professional development, and intersection with individuals of different identities. UW River Falls is required to submit an annual progress report to the U.S. Department of Education for review and approval to receive continued funding to, to receive continued funding. The program has been renewed six times over 23 years, with the most recent renewal in 2022, receiving an almost 100% evaluation score on program performance. In the past three progress reports, an average 91% of program participants are both first generation and low income. The Upward Bound Program at UW River Falls currently serves 83% Asian American and or Southeast Asian students, with the remaining population primarily Black, African American, and Hispanic students. In the nomination materials, Provost David Travis commended the results of the program, saying, and I quote, I have personally met several students that came to UW River Falls or other UW system schools after participating in our Upward Bound program, and they expressed how important it was for them in their development, end quote. Please join me in congratulating the UW River Falls Upward Bound program and help me wel welcome Dr. B. Vang, who will accept the award on the program's behalf. Good morning, Nyo Zhong. Um, I'm honored to receive this award on behalf of the UW River Falls Upper Bound Program. My counterpart, Mai Tao Yang, is not here today. She is busy preparing for our February monthly meeting, which is actually tomorrow. <laughs> so I have a couple of different remarks about, um, you know, just all the detail and attention that we give our students that really prepares them for success and also makes our program such a success. Investment in youth programming is essential for bridging achievement gaps. In working with young people, I see them grow year after year from ninth grade to graduation. But the growth that I see them after the first year of college, it's leaps and bounds, it's unmeasurable. Programs such as Upper Bound provides youth from low-income and first-generation 
um, college students' resources, they're not really available for them compared to their peers. Not only do we educate, guide, and advise, but we help them mentally prepare themselves for the future challenges that will come their way beyond high school and in college. In our program, we hold space for the participants to develop their positive self-concepts in our community. We provide a wide range of choices and experiences for youth, mentoring, it's interdisciplinary coursework, service learning projects, and cultural experiences. Gradually, the unfamiliar becomes familiar. We always encourage them to try something new. They're in a space where they can try, fail, try again, and reflect upon their decisions to better themselves. They get to practice making choices, suggest options, and more importantly, we encourage them to ask these questions. Instead of saying, can I do this? How can I do this? Through all these experiences, they get to reimagine their life and dream and create their own future. This physical, mental, and emotional practice is important. When they encounter scenarios in their future where they become overwhelmed, their body will remember they've done it before. Make new friends, connect to a community or a network, self-advocate and ask for help, walk on a college campus, hold yourself to high standards, grow yourself, and try something new by stepping some outside your comfort zone. The combined efforts of our participants and families, program staff, community, and campus partners allows for such a program to shine. Thank you for this honor, and we will continue to prepare young people for their future aspirations. Thank you very much and congratulations again to our award winners and also to the nominees. We so appreciate the work you're doing. And speaking of thanks, we'd like to thank Chancellor Manukin and her team for their hospitality during our time here. I will now call upon Regent Amy Bogus, one of many proud UW Badgers in this room, to read our resolution of appreciation to UW Madison for hosting this February meeting. Thank you, um, President Regent Walsh. And Thank you so much to UW-Madison and especially to Chancellor Mnookin and your incredible staff and team. Um, I think for this being the very first meeting you've hosted, you've killed it. Um, we really appreciate it. Where as Madison is the official host campus for the board's February 2023 meeting, and are grateful for the generous hospitality extended this month by Chancellor Jennifer Mnookin and the entire Badger community. And whereas the board appreciated hearing Chancellor Mnookin's thoughtful presentation about how UW-Madison is enhancing excellence, overcoming obstacles and pursuing partnerships. And whereas the Business and Finance Committee learned of UW-Madison's progress on supporting the mission of the university through an intentional focus on generating additional revenues and improving operations, and whereas the Capital and Budget Committee gained a deeper understanding of how, of how UW-Madison is trans transforming the built environment and devising a comprehensive strategy for future facilities planning, crucial to the success of the university and its mission of research, education, and outreach. And whereas the Education Committee was intrigued to learn more about how UW-Madison is adapting to change regarding the impacts of artificial intelligence on higher education, including the recently launched chat box known as ChatGPT, and whereas the board benefited from hearing the panel discussion about UW-Madison's university business partnerships, including the impact those collaborations have had, ideas of what the university can do to do better partner with industry, and the importance of maintaining a strong university for the economic health of the state. And whereas the board was pleased to tour the nine-story 
tower of the chemistry building, getting a firsthand look at the new building's lecture halls, information commons, offices, teaching laboratories, and group spaces for undergraduate teaching labs. Be it therefore resolved that the Board of Regents hereby thanks UW-Madison for this month's informative presentations, its forward-thinking spirit, and its many continued contributions to the UW system and to the state of Wisconsin. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Bogus. Before we adjourn, do Regents have any communications, petitions, or memorials to share? Yes. I wanted to recognize Aaron Birdbear, who retired last month after nearly 23 years in various roles of UW Madison, with his last very important position at the university's as the university's inaugural tribal relations director. Aaron had a profound effect on the campus community changing the way we understand and view this land and its history of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He successfully pushed the university toward acknowledging, embracing, and celebrating the full 12,000-year human history of the Ho-Chunk land that this institution inhabits. His legacy can be seen across campus from improved recruitment, retention, and graduation, graduation rates for American Indian and Alaska Native students to DeJoe Residence Hall, which he helped shape as it was being designed. One of the most prominent legacies is the popular First Nations cultural landscape tour, and it has become a powerful part of the campus educational experience. Since Aaron first started giving the tour in 2003, Aaron and his colleague, Omar Polar, approximately 15,000 people have been introduced to the First Nations of Wisconsin through its place-based experiential learning, including a most recent tour he gave to Samantha Brown from the PBS show, Places to Love. You should all take a look at that. We wish Aaron all the best in his retirement. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe Chancellor Evetovich uh, has something she would like to add. Good morning. Thank you for allowing me to highlight a story of one of our students. We're thrilled this weekend to support UW Platteville student Nadalis Hamill, who is a member of Diné, the Diné and Ho Chunk Nations. Nadalis is a business administration major, sophomore uh, at UW Platteville, and a very talented hoop dancer. And um, he supports his family's business called Native Spirit Productions, which is a company that specializes in indigenous music and cultural dance performances. And I'm told after graduation, he, he majored in business so he could continue. He is also amazingly accomplished as a dancer. Uh, to name one of his many accomplishments, he was named the 2020 Teen World Champion Hoop Dancer at the 30th Annual World Championship Hoop Dancing Contest at the Heard Museum and will be performing nationally this weekend in Arizona at the Super Bowl. Hoop dancing um, has a rich and beautiful cultural significance and it's ex extremely exciting to watch. So I invite you all to join us in watching that this weekend. I was reading one of the um, uh, interviews that he gave and he was asked who he was going to root for this weekend and like many Wisconsinites he said my team is not in the Super Bowl so <laughs> if you would like something that we can all root for please tune in and watch our wonderful student um, uh, perform his his great talent thank you thank you Chancellor very much all right thank you for your attention and your attendance and we are adjourned